today is what we like to call Vision Sunday. And some people say, what does that mean? Well, uh, we haven't had uh, Vision Sunday. The first uh, January I came in, I tried to do it the first of the year. First January I came here. Um, it was just getting going, so I didn't want to have a vision yet. I wanted to see what was going on with the church. And the next January, we won't talk about what happened. And um, then the next January comes along, and we'll talk about what that happened. So now, here we are, 2022. And so I want to have a Vision Sunday, kind of help you guys know what's going on. And so I'm so excited to share my heart with you all. But in the Bible, the word vision is usually seen when someone has a, a, a dream. Um, usually a supernatural appearance that usually brings a revelation from God. So I, I don't want to sit there and for you to think that somehow God came to me in a dream and uh, and I saw a vision of God and a revelation outside of God's Word because I didn't. Uh, everything we're going to talk about today is is led by God and God's Word, but also where I think that God is as prayer and uh, asking God to lead us specifically in specific mission points for our church. Um, I think God has given us a pretty clear direction. And so uh, the vision I'm talking about is a vision to look forward, to help lead us uh, today. It's a mental image, so to speak, of what uh, our church wants to be doing and be about and who we are. Um, and so, so hopefully some point in the future, uh, based on God's leading and our goals and our mission, uh, we will achieve the goals of what we're putting out there as a vision. And so sometimes visions are like right now visions. Some of them are, we've already been doing them. We're going to continue them. And some of them are like 5, 10, 15 years out. And so we're going to be kind of looking at a little bit of that today. So, But vision is necessary to a church. Why? Because God said so, right? If God said so, we should have a vision, right? He says in Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. Now, it's clear from the context, if you read this in context, the vision that God is talking about is a true vision from uh, the word of God, that God has spoken to them from that. And when we look into his word, we see clearly what God is saying. And so uh, that's not too far off from what I'm talking about today, and I'll explain that in just a second. In other words, when there is no vision, no direction from God, people will do their own thing. Uh, they will go their own way and always leads to disaster. In fact, the word perish here, where there, there's no vision, the people perish, most people think they die. But that's not really what the original word means. The original word means to be let loose of restraint, to cause or show a lack of restraint or go wild. I think about that, right? Without a vision or a direction to go, we will go our own way, go out without restraint, and we'll go wild, right? That does not seem like a good thing for a church, does it? So if we would ask Jesus, who is the Word of God in the flesh, where he wants us to go, he will lead us. When we look into his Word, we have a vision, look into his Word, Jesus Christ's Word, he will show us clearly where to go. Most of the time, the vision for all churches are the same, to share the gospel to the world. Every church out there, doesn't matter denomination, if you're a believer in Christ, your mission, your vision is to share the gospel with the world. But God has also directs individual churches, and he's given each church a direct mission uh, to be specific in their community. So each community and each um, personality of a church uh, that God has given us a direction of where to go, specifically for our community. So the question is, where do we go? Now, it may seem like we should be able to just keep doing the same old thing. We, we've always been had a vision. We've always been sharing the gospel. And in a general, that would be a good thing because if God says, keep doing what you're doing, keep doing it, right? It's definitely a good thing. But should that be the reason why we do it? Well, God gave a vision in 1964 to pastor so-and-so, and we've been doing that since. Well, that's wonderful, but has he given us a new vision, a new direction to keep up with the community and stuff like that? Well, I don't know. We've just been doing it the way we did it since 1964, right? So maybe we need to stop and go, okay, okay, God, is there a different vision? Is there a different direction? Is there a different way? Is there a different path you want us to be going on? Our community has changed. There's some way we can reach our community differently. Uh, society has changed, right? Uh, 64, they didn't have internet, right? Uh, 1964, they didn't have a lot of the problems that we have today. So uh, maybe God says, well, yeah, if you keep doing it the way you did in 1964, you're not going to reach the people in 2022. 
So the question has to be then, where are we to go? Now, individually, each person here has their own mission. God has a specific mission for you and your life. Know that. Individually, you have your own mission. You have your own vision. You should be knowing where God is leading you directly. But get this. Know that your individual mission will somehow, some way, weave seamlessly with the mission of your church. That's the way God does. That's the way he works. He's not going to say, oh, you have your own vision, but it's not going to work with the church, so you're just going to go do your own thing. No. Our, our individual mandates, our individual missions will weave seamlessly together. But what usually happens is this. God gives you a heart, gives you a vision, gives you something to think about, gives you something to do. And you come to the church and say, the church must do it this way now. Because that's what God tells me to do it. Not necessarily how it works either. Sometimes people say, well, I think the church should do this. And I go, well, you are the church. Go for it. <laughs> well, I think we should all do that. Well, no, God gave you that heart. Do it. You don't need me to do it. You don't need me to go, okay, I'll get on board with you. If God leads you to do it, you go do it. And get this. If someone gave, if God gave someone a, a, a vision, a mission to do in the church seamlessly together in 1980, and that person dies, did you know that it's okay to stop doing what they already did? We don't have to just keep doing it because, well, they started in 1980. we got to keep doing it. No. God gave them that vision. Now, he may give someone else a vision to take on. But this is what happens. I see people say, well, we got to keep doing it because so-and-so started in 1980. And uh, I'm going to do it because she's gone. And I, someone's got to do it. And they hate it. I mean, they don't say they hate it. But you just kind of tell their heart's not in it. Why? Because they're doing it out of duty, because we got to keep doing it, versus because their heart is in it, and God gave them a vision to do it. So I want you to think about that. When I bring something to the church and I go, here's where the church is going, who would like to be a part of it? Don't do it because you're like, well, I have to now. No, God will lead you in your heart to follow a different direction, and that's okay. So God will keep people together. And and if we're going in different directions, that's wild, right? Without restraint, we're going in different directions. That's a disorganized group of individuals going wild, right? That's not a church. And that's not vision. That is division, right? No matter how much a local church has going for it, division can cancel the vision. When you look at the word division, you see it a prefix die, means double, and vision, double vision, right? Double vision is not a good thing. If you have double vision, you're seeing double, you need to go to the doctor. Amen? Well, if we have double vision in our church, if a disharmony in our church, we need some spiritual healing as well. We need to go to God and say, God, help us not have this division, not have this double vision. We want to be all together. So we need to be united, all the same page. Now, don't get me wrong. Your ideas are not wrong. A lot of people think, well, because I didn't go with your idea, I think that your idea is wrong. No, it may be perfectly right for you, it, but it's not right for the whole, right? You can go do that. I will support you. I will love you. I will pray for you. Whatever you can do, you go do that. But it's going to weave seamlessly with what God is having us do each individually. So it doesn't mean your ideas are wrong, but we all have to have the main goal and the same goal. Um, when I was in a church in Kansas, there was so much division, and I brought all the men that were in the leadership together. At the time, we just had, uh, there was just men in the leadership team. And we brought them all together, and I said, hey, when we discuss something here, and we decide this is what we're going to do as a whole, and we vote on it, whatever we want to do, and uh, let's say there's two of you that don't agree, but everyone else agrees, that's a unanimous, I mean, it's not a unanimous, but it's a majority vote, whatever. When we walk out this door, everyone is unanimous, because we're all doing the exact same thing, we're on the same page. What was happening is, they didn't vote for it, so they went home, told their wife about it, the wife started calling everyone, telling them we're not doing it, and they would sit there and go, nope, we're not doing it. Right? Because I didn't vote for it, we're not doing it. Right? That's, that's not the way church goes, that's not the way God wants us to go. So when we think about that and say, well, pastor didn't like my idea, so I ain't doing his idea. Right? That's not the way we're supposed to do it, that's not the way it is. You do your thing, I'm going to do my thing, they're going to do their thing, but seamlessly it's all going to work together in God's vision. And you'll see that, it's amazing. So God gives us some things to help us be united. First of all, he says for us to speak the same thing. 1 Corinthians 1.10, now ask you, brothers or sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, so this is why we're focused, right, Jesus Christ, by his name, 
that you all speak in agreement and there'll be no divisions among you. Right? We must have unity of speech if a local church is to make an impact for God. So what if we went out the door and they said, what does your church believe? Well, I don't know, but I believe this. Right? And they're like, well, do you believe, is that what your church believes? And they're like, no, my church doesn't believe that, but I don't believe what my church believes. I believe this. Okay, you can believe differently, but if you walk out the door and representing the church as if that's what the church believes, that's not the unified speaking together, right? That's really what it's talking about. They had a group of people that came together, and they were going to have this church here, and, and this church in Corinth, and they were getting together, and they had Jewish people, and they had pagan people, and they had non-religious people, and they're all coming together, and they're like, what do we believe? And we're like, well, I believe uh, that Jesus is coming back. Well, I don't believe Jesus is coming back. Well, I believe you have to be uh, follow the Jewish customs and go to the temple. I don't believe we have the Jewish customs. And, and they're all like just going off crate. They're all going wild, right? And Paul comes in and says, hey, guys, this is, this is the biblical aspect. This is what I want you all to focus on. Get your mind. Speak the same thing. Now, you can say, my church believes this. I know what they believe, but I don't believe that yet. That's okay. You cannot believe that. But don't tell, out and tell people the church believes something differently because you don't like it. Right? So that's not one speech. Right? Well, it's also things about that what if we decided well, we're going to go do this activity. Let's say, let's say yesterday we went to that destination unknown. And you thought that was the stupidest thing in the world. Like, that's just ridiculous. Right? And you went out telling people, that's just ridiculous. You shouldn't do that. That's the stupidest thing in the world. I don't even know why our church does it. And you, you went around just telling everybody that. That's not unity in speech. You're not bringing unity together, right? You're causing disunity, right? So we're told by this passage, even when we do disagree, and it's okay to disagree, there's nothing wrong with disagreeing. But when we do disagree, to speak in such a way is to promote harmony. Right? Your motive for speaking and how you deliver your words are just as important as what you say. Be careful of a critical spirit. If you find yourself hypercritical of everything done in your church and of others in your church and of your pastor, there are two options. One, your church needs you to be positive and change what's going on wrong if there's something wrong. Or two, your attitude needs to change, right? Either way, your critical spirit is not helping. So ask yourself, is there something else going on in my life that right now that is causing me to be angry or discouraged and I'm taking it out on everyone else? Usually, that's what happened this week. Someone was hurt and hurting, not because I hurt them, but they were just hurting in general, and they lashed out at me because they're hurting. And I knew that. And so I just had a take it because they're hurting. And whether they'll ever realize that or not, I don't know. But in, in their life, they're hurting and they want to hurt someone else. Well, be careful we don't do the same thing in the church. You are hurt by a church, so you're going to hurt someone else. Or you are, you are hurt by someone, so you want to hurt someone else. Two years ago, pastor didn't like my ideas, so I'm not going to like any one more of his ideas for the rest of my life. You laugh. But I've heard that exact statement before, not from any of you, from someone of a different state, right? Be careful. Ask yourself. And it's probably a good time to maybe pray this prayer that we heard in Psalms. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Like, God, is, is this from me? Is this my critical spirit? Is this me angry? Or is this really something that needs to change? And if it, something needs to change, I need to go to my pastor and go to my church council and go to the leadership and say, hey, there's something that we, we're doing wrong and we need to change this and let's talk about how we can do that as a unified body. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with that, right? But we got to do it with the right spirit. He tells us that unity in speech and also to be perfectly joined together in the same mind. 1 Corinthians 1.10. But be perfectly joined together in the same mind. There must be a unity of thought if a local church is to have an effective impact for God. Now, what happens sometimes is, and I've been part of these churches that have, we have seven points of what we believe. Now, those are fairly generic. What I mean by that is, uh, we've been part of a church that had 25 points, right? Because each one of those was breaking down to small little, you know, nuggets, whatever, and yet I believe every single point right? Or you couldn't join the church. And I, I didn't even know all of them. I had to open the book and go, I can't remember what point that is. Oh yeah, it's down here, you know? And I don't know if it was like 25 points or 30 points, 
but it was broken down and even subpoints and subpoints and subpoints and like that's just way too much. And so we can believe seven points. We're like, oh yeah, I can believe all those seven, right? But if we started discussing the details of those seven, we may disagree a little bit. That's okay. But we have one mind to focus on one thing, and that's Jesus Christ. So to have one mind, once again, unity and uniformity are not the same thing. We don't all have to look like Pastor Blake and act like Pastor Blake and talk like Pastor Blake. No. We can be our individual selves, but have unified into one thing, and that's Jesus Christ. God has given us all different perspectives to bring us to the table, and I love that. Right? There are people in this church that are not on the leadership team but they have a unique perspective, and they always seem to, to think about uh, things in a different way. And uh, I still open it up, and, and I ask them. I say, hey, what do you think about this? I want to hear your thoughts on it. You're not the leadership team, but I want to hear your thoughts because I need to hear different perspectives. Proverbs tells us that where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. I've refinished a few kitchen cabinets in my life. And no matter how much you sand, no matter how much you, you, uh, you know, finish it all and paint it and stain it and get it all looking perfect, if the joints of the cabinets are not fitly joined together, it's going to fall apart. You get pretty cabinets that are all walky and falling apart, it does no good, right? A church may look beautiful and have the latest technology, the best innovative programs, and the sharpest presentations, but without unity, it will collapse and fall. And I won't say a name, but there's a major giant church in our area that has every technology and every plan and program that's out there. And people could go to that church and love it. They could watch it on TV. And uh, they just think it's the greatest thing in the world. But it is collapsing internally. The pastor resigned just a couple weeks ago. And it's just chaos. So when we see all of that, they were not unified at all. They weren't unified at all. And the lack of money during COVID, I think, exposed that lack of unification. They were focused on the things and not on Jesus together. So how can we accomplish this objective? How can we be perfectly joined together with the same mind? We can all spend time studying the Bible together. When we are here Sunday morning, Worship together and study the Bible together. We begin to learn about each other and learn about our God and our, our uh, Savior together. But did you know we have more than Sunday morning? We have Sunday nights. We have individual Bible studies, ladies' Bible studies. We have other times and other opportunities. We have youth group and children's group. We have other opportunities. We have opportunities to serve. With, uh, can you imagine uh, uh, serving together next to someone, like at a funeral or, or something like that, and you're serving next to them? You get to know them, don't you? Uh, way differently than you're sitting across the room with each other. And you get to be joining together. Uh, doing activities like we did yesterday. Sitting together with activities. Uh, we had uh, people that didn't know each other. We got to hang out with each other. We had someone there that didn't even speak our language. She spoke a different language. And it was fun to sit and to learn about her and talk with her in a different language. We have to learn about you. Those are activities and service opportunities and, and worship opportunities that you get together. So when you don't go to all those, and you only come to one, then there's not going to be as big of a unification because it's hard to unify with just one sitting in a pew. So God has said, hey, the early church, they met daily. Daily. Why? To help them be unified together. And I really do believe that's one of the reasons why our churches uh, overall in the, in the nation are falling apart because they only meet for 45 minutes on Sunday morning and that's it. There's no way to be unified during that time. Some churches are splitting up services. They have three services. There's no way you can be on the same page with someone who met at 8.30 and you're meeting at 11.30. You don't even know them, right? So a unification together. We worship, we pray together regularly. We, we pray uh, faithfully. We fellowship together constantly. These are the things that help us on the, be on the same page. How can you be part of something in unity when you have uh, maybe 20% of activities? How would that work with your marriage, with your family? If you only talk with them and met with them and 20% of the time. I don't think that would work very well, do you? <laughs> now, some may say, I like it when my husband's out of town a long time. Or vice versa, right? But they're still talking back and forth every day. 
right? May not be underneath your foot, but they're still talking. Guys retire, and the wives are going, really? You retired, and now you're just sitting at home? Really? Right? But how about you walk in a home, and both of y'all eat different meals, sleep in different beds, don't talk to each other, and only come out on Sunday to say hi to each other? Like, that's not a good marriage, and that marriage is not going to go well. There's going to be struggles and stress. We're a family. We're a church family. You're, you're part of this family together. And so we have opportunities for us to gather together and, and get to know each other, to be unified in one mind. He tells that unity in speech, be perfectly joined together in the same mind, be perfectly joined together with the same judgment. 1 Corinthians 10 says, but be perfectly joined in the same mind and the same judgment. That word judgment here means our thoughts concerning what ought to be done. In that vision, we're coming together and we're thinking what ought to be done. Let's come together with the same judgment. What is our purpose? What is our goals? There must be a unity of purpose if a local church is to have an impact for God. God's purposes are far greater than our own minor differences of the local church. What color the carpet is, who cares? What color the walls are, we don't care. What color the lights are on Sunday morning, we don't care. It doesn't matter. Those things are so minor that I didn't turn that light on all the way and it's bugging me. It doesn't matter. It was my fault. I turned it on but didn't turn it all the way. It doesn't matter. What matters is Jesus. That's what matters. Right? I talked to a man a while back, a long time ago, and uh, he had been given kind of his... Uh, <laughs> so he's going to go up there and turn it on. Thank you, Lana. She <laughs> taking care of me. She <laughs> he was uh, given the diagnosis, and the, and the doctor pretty much said, you're going to die, and he thought it was coming and whatever. And he never wanted to hear about God, never wanted to talk about God. But finally, he was able to start talking about God, and his, his heart opened up and started sharing things of God with him. And he was kind of making decisions. But through that process, his body began to healing, and the doctor said, yeah, your, your body's healing. I, I think you're going to live for a while. And you know what happened? He stopped caring about God again. Right? Because he didn't need God anymore. I'm living now. I did fine. I'll be fine. I don't need God. Right? He became cold toward the spiritual things again. Now, I'm not telling you this to criticize the individual, but to point out how perspective changes when we grapple with eternity. When we realize that we are here and we're to focus on the eternal things, then whether a light's on or not just doesn't matter. Right? It just doesn't matter what songs we sing. It just doesn't matter whether it's too hot or too cold in the auditorium, right? It just doesn't matter when you think of eternity. So when we think of those things and, and the eternal grapplings of what we're dealing with, these things just don't matter. What will really matter whether or not we allowed God to do his work in his church. I believe that God has given you a specific plan for each of you as individuals. I talked about this earlier. But Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so we should walk in them. So each and every person has a specific work that God wants you to do. That's why he gives us different uh, spiritual gifts. Hebrews 12.1, Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. You have a race. I have a race. They have a race. And we have to run the race that God has set before us. But can you imagine watching the Olympics? We're watching the Winter Olympics. I have not watched the Winter Olympics yet. I don't know why. I just haven't turned it on, been busy. But in the Summer Olympics, they have these guys that run a lap, you know, and they, they have them in lanes. But if you ever watch the Summer Olympics and, and watch when they, they run these laps, some of them, they stay in their own lane. And some of them, at a certain point, they get out of their lane. And that confuses me. I don't know what it is. I don't know why. Like, stay in your lane. But anyway, maybe if someone else can tell me later why. But they're out of the lane. So when I watch the ones when they're in the lane, I go, oh, that's so organized. I think that's great. And then when they get out of their lane, they're just kind of running like this. I go, that looks so messed up. Right? So I think of that with a church. If we all stay in our lane, we're still in the same race together. We're still working together. We're all together. But as soon as you start getting out of your lane, you start bumping into me. That's how people trip and fall. People are like bumping into each other, right? So when we get out of our own lane and, and uh, start doing it in someone else's lane and telling them how to do their thing, we start getting messed up. So let's run the race that's set before us, but we can, we're running in the same race. You just may be in a different lane, and that's okay. Again, seamlessly working together as a unified 
force. We need to understand that God not only has a plan for our individual life, but he calls you to see that a plan fulfilled alongside other believers is what the church is about. See, he called you for a plan, but he called you to specifically to come to a church. You know, the pastor's not the only one who's called. You may hear this like, oh, I felt called to come to this church, and God led me to this church. Do you realize that technically every individual member of this church is called to hear that God somehow put it in your heart to be a part of this congregation? And you felt like that this is your church and you, you were called to this place to serve and, and do something. Well, if he called you to serve in this place, then there's a job for you in this place. And there's a job for you in this place that we're going to work together seamlessly to figure out the vision that God has for all of us individually. Now, if you've ever been a part of a multicultural church, I hope one day our church is more multicultural. Because I think that's really uh, uh, where our community is going. So therefore, our church should reflect that. But when we think about that, an idea, you have people that speak different languages, you have people that have different skin colors, different backgrounds, different cultural, different music styles, you have all those things, but they work together seamlessly because they're focused on Jesus Christ. And they know that they are called to be there. So having a vision for our church from God is important. It's important because of people around us. We need to have the sense that God's direction for his church because it will have a direct impact on the people outside these walls. See, if the church inside here is not together, we're double-visioned, we're divided, then the people out there are going to know it. And how do you know they're going to know it? Because I'll hear about it. I heard your church is in chaos over there. I heard y'all all fighting over there. I, right? When, when COVID started, I heard that we closed our doors and we weren't going to open them again. I'm like, where did that come from? But it was on Facebook, so right, it's going to get out there, right? It, so if we're if we're divided inside here and we have division, the community is going to know about it. But the other way is also true. When we're unified together, the community is going to know about it. There's something going on over there, Calvary Baptist Church in Port Acres. They are so unified; they're just like on fire for Jesus. It's pretty exciting. What's going on? Let's go be a part of that. They need to see that our life is radically different than the traditional church member. The kind of difference that can only be seen in the lives of people that are living for God and on God's mission. God wants us to live lives that show what kind of difference can be made when you know Christ and Christ gets to live out of us. Gain a sense of his vision for here at Calvary. Gain a sense of what God is doing. And join our journey in his direction for our community. God invites us to seek his face hear his voice, and go where he tells us to go. For the sake of our community and his kingdom, we need to do that together. As a result of our church being in fellowship with God and following his vision, we can be used for him to literally make a difference in the lives of people outside these doors in our community. A church with a vision is one where the people have sought God for guidance as to how they're going about reaching their community for Christ. Now, I'm not going to put anyone on the spot. Don't raise your hand. Don't, just, I don't just want to stop and think about, have you this week prayed, God, show me a vision for my church? Did you last week? Did you the week before and the week before and the week before and the week before for the last three years? I have. I've been praying since before I moved here, God, show me a vision Show me direction where you want this church to go every single week. So when I think about that, we should all be praying that. Because God's not going to give me a different answer than he's going to give you. But you may have a different answer, but if it's not from God because you haven't been praying, well, I just don't, I mean, I haven't really prayed about it, but I just don't think that's the right way to should go. Well, maybe you need to be praying about it for the last three years, right? Again, when we look to God and we're coming together, that's what God's right. It's not the pastor's only job. It's the pastor's job that tells us where to go. We just follow him. No, it's the Holy Spirit that's in all of us. A church with a vision is one where the people have sought God for guidance. A church without a vision will inevitably find itself practicing religion instead of Christianity. You know the difference, right? The message of religion is that man in his own efforts are doing everything he can to reach up to God. But Christianity, true believers, is God and his efforts reaching down to man and using man to serve in his kingdom. 
A church without a vision will inevitably find itself falling in the religious crowd. A church with no vision does not understand how to partner with God and His kingdom to do work. They have their own plans, their own ideas, what they think, and they always struggle. They always have division. They're always fighting. And what usually happens is people just show up on Sunday, go through the motions. But the church who has a vision concerning how God wants to partner with them as He is doing the work through them will have a let's go attitude, let's do it. Let's do what God's doing in our community. Let's let God use us in our community. Which best describes our church? Are we religious? Are we truly followers of Christ? Now, as a whole, our church is following Christ. But there might be a few individuals that feel like they're still kind of going through the motions. That's okay. That's where you're at. But our church is going to be looking to what Christ is going to lead us to do and follow him and that we want to do this together. So let's talk about some ideas for vision for here at Calvary Baptist Church in Port Acres. These are some thoughts that God has given me to lead us. And I think that we can put these together and kind of understand what he is doing. So first of all, our church will continue to preach, teach, and share the good news of Jesus Christ. That good news is for everyone, no matter the race, no matter the gender, no matter the nationality, no matter the language, citizenship, political leaning, or sexual orientation. The gospel of Jesus Christ is for everyone. The good news is simply put, Jesus Christ lived a perfect life, died on the cross to take our sins away, was buried in a tomb, and three days later, he rose again to give us new life. That is a glorious, wonderful gospel news. The good news is a simple message. Do you believe in that simple message of Jesus Christ as your Savior? Well, that simple message, we will continue to proclaim it as a good news for everyone until he returns. Our church will continue to allow everyone to enter into those doors, no matter the race, no matter the gender, no matter the nationality, no matter the language, the, no matter the citizenship, political leaning, or sexual orientation, everyone is welcome into those doors. We will not discriminate. We will not be a respecter of persons. We'll be a loving church that welcomes each and every one to sit with us, to worship with us, to pray with us, to, to learn with us, equally at the foot of the cross. We will continue to allow everyone to enter those doors until he returns. Our church will continue to adapt our worship style to be in the most effective way to reach the community we live in. That doesn't mean we're getting rid of the old hymns. We sang two of them this morning. But what it does mean is that we will try the best of our ability to set aside our own preferences of music so that the world outside can be reached with his glorious gospel. Just like we have adapted our social media presence, the internet, and modern technology, we must also be willing to adapt the ways we proclaim the good news of gospel, no matter how much we like the old ways. We will continue to adapt our worship style until he comes again. Our church in the next year will develop a discipleship plan so that everyone who desires to learn and follow Christ in their daily life and who wants to learn how to teach others to do it has an opportunity to do so. In the next two years, we'll implement this plan and make this part of our core principles of our church. Disciples making disciples will strengthen our church, be the strongest it can ever be in the years to come. We will continue to make disciples who make disciples until he returns. Our church in the next three years will strive to tackle several uh, physical projects and have them completed by the year 2024. These projects include, but are not limited to, and are not in any particular order. Education building bathrooms are remodeled. Community prayer and meditation courtyard to be installed. Education building hallway remodeled, the floor, the ceiling, the lighting. The church offices be remodeled. Power wash outside of the buildings. Add gravel to the outside of our parking lot area to expand the, the parking. Shore up and remodel and then reside the garage. Install a lighted sign in front of our church building. These projects take money and plenty of volunteers. But for our church to continue to reach our community, we need to be good stewards of the assets that God has given us. And we need to show all who drive by or walk in 
that we care about the building and the assets that God has given us. Because if we care about the assets that God has given us, then we care about the people that are in them. And that's what the world sees. We'll continue to keep our facilities looking and working good until he returns. Our church will continue to focus on the children of our community. This includes narrowing the focus of our financial obligations as well as our programs to show not only by our words but also by our actions that the children in our community are important to us. We will recruit and train dedicated leaders and teachers to help with the children's and youth programs. These leaders and teachers will also be screened and trained in child safety and will know the church policy so that we can do everything in our power to keep the children that we are entrusted with safe. We'll continue to focus on the children of our community until he returns. Now, some of these items are spiritual direction. Some of these items are administrative direction. Some of these items are a physical, literally, direction. But all of them will take unity and the resources that God brings with it. Those resources include our time, our own skills, our own desires, and our own financial means. I will publish these in print form if anybody wants them, and you can look at them indirect, directly. But I think if we'd all be in unity with this vision, we'd be unstoppable for reaching this community for Jesus Christ. So that there is no division, we need to have the same vision. And that vision is Christ and where Christ is leading us. What he is doing through our church here in our community of Port Acres, we will do together. We will submit ourselves to his leading so he can continue to do his work in us and through us seamlessly together as his church. So the question is, do you desire unity in his church? And if so, let's unite together as he leads in the next 5, 10, 15, 25, 50, 100 years, however long it is, until he returns. Amen? Let's all stand together and worship him together in song and prayer. But in our speech, in our mind, and in our goals, we are unified. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you.